Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the mentoring session. Uh, this is the second mentoring session on uh, data pre-processing. So um, I would like to welcome you all for participating in today's session. And at the same time, I would like to welcome my colleague, Mia, who is going to work through uh, this session. So everyone, welcome. And, and of course, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. You can open your mic, but also you can use the chat function. So over to you, Mia. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so as Thomas has just mentioned, this comes as our second part. Um, our first session was last week on computer networks. And today we're going to be doing a slight introduction on data pre-processing. Um, as mentioned in the email, this is a introductory beginners course, but it does relay back to some of our previous um, challenge solutions. And so hopefully that will help you solve some of this year's problem statements as well. So here's what we'll just be going over. So first, the importance of data pre-processing and then some data pre-processing techniques, as well as a Q&A session and a Jupyter Notebooks practice session. Um, so first, let's take a look at a, our machine learning steps. So we have first the step of collecting our data and then pre-processing it, cleaning up our data basically before inputting it into our model, evaluating it and then deploying it. So today we're going to be taking your first step or actually the second step into the, in the machine learning steps before uh, when we put our data into our model building section here. So why do we do data pre-processing? Well, we do data pre-processing for many reasons. Uh, as shown in the slide, we first do it to check accuracy, to check whether the data is um, correct or not, to check whether the data is completely available or if there is some data that is missing, Consistency, consistency, timeliness, believability, interoperability. Doing data pre-processing and not doing it can have fairly large effects on your outcome. Um, as you can see here on the graph on the right, we see that the accuracy can change uh, depending on whether you have pre-processed the data or not. Uh, other effect is that if you do data pre-processing, uh, you can uh, greatly reduce your computational resources ne uh, necessary to create your machine learning model. And so it's quite important to data pre-process before creating your model. So as we just saw, we saw our machine learning steps here. We're just going to take a look at how these machine learning steps work in an actual real life setting. So this was taken from a specification from ITU called ITU Y.3172. You can find this on the internet as well. Uh, this is just showing how a machine learning pipeline works in a communication network setting. So you first have the source in communication networks. These are devices such as our phones or our computers. Uh, the data is collected from the source. So this C shows our collector. This collected data is then pre-processed here in the pre-producer, which is then put into the model. And then the policy here basically decides on the outcome, depending on the outcome of the machine learning model, uh, the policy basically decides whether it's good or bad, tells what the distributor to do, and basically the distributor takes action towards the sync, which is the target of the machine learning output. Many times during communication networks, this sync is Oftentimes, mostly our source, but obviously that can depend um, on what your situation is. So if we take a, um, a real life situation, for example, let's say you are watching a video on your phone. So your source is the phone. If you have a machine learning model implemented, what it does is basically it takes the data, for example, on the quality of the video, collects that data, pre-processes that data, puts it in the machine learning model, and the machine learning model will basically give out some uh, values or give out some outputs and basically the policy decides uh, whether that's good enough or bad enough. So for example, if the data collected is on the quality of service of the video, so for example, the throughput, um, then the policy will decide whether that throughput is good enough or bad enough. And for example, if it's not good enough or if it's under a certain threshold, then it will 
um, ask the distributor to basically improve the quality of the video and the distributor will take action towards the sync. So in this case, again, the sync would be the phone thus improving the quality of your video that you're watching. And within data pre-processing, we have a fair, a fair number of steps that you can take. This depends on what kind of situation you're dealing with. But on the upper right here, we have these four processes that you can take, data cleaning, data integration, data reduction, and then data transformation. Or we have, you can go about doing it this way. This second selection on the left um, was taken from one of our previous problem statement solutions from a team called SSN ITU. You can see their paper here on the GitHub. Um, but basically they decided to data restructure and then data smoothen, do feature selection to take out certain features, do data augmentation before implementing it into their model. So we're going to take a look at some of the techniques that you can use. Today we're only going to be um, introducing three, data cleaning, data a transformation and dimension, reduc uh, redu uh, dimension reduction. Uh, obviously there are many different ways that you can process your data, but we're going to just be taking a look at these three today. So the first step is uh, data cleaning. So many times our data that we can have can be very noisy. So noisy data is referred to meaningless data or data that is corrupt. And we're just going to take a look at some examples. For example, this data is on uh, people's age, height, and sex. And as we can see here in the height column, we've got a negative number, which is incoherent as I cannot be a negative number. So we might use data cleaning to change this value to maybe change it to a null value or just take out that row completely. Uh, we can also have outliers as well. As we can see here, this is data on the temperature in a certain region across the year. As we can see here, the number between June and August is doesn't follow the route it should probably take. And so we can use again, data cleaning to clean up this data. There are many ways that you can go about cleaning data, uh, noisy data, but one technique or one way that we'll be introducing today is on smoothing. So this is basically what smoothing does. So if we take a look at it visually, our data can have a lot of noise like so, but if we take out the noise here in the middle, then we can see the overall smoother trend, which helps the model uh, calculate easier or it reduces the computational resources necessary for the machine learning model. So this is what I'll be introducing today, smoothing. Uh, again, within smoothing, there are many techniques that you can use. The first and quite popular one is called the moving mean. Uh, so if you take a look at this, Data. This data is just showing the year and the number of people. The moving mean basically takes, so for example, if you decide the moving mean to be three, then it takes every three pieces of data and calculates the mean and replaces each data with this new moving average. And this basically reduces the values that you have and has a smoothing effect. So if we take a look at our graph on the right here, this blue line is our original data, but if you smoothen it, it will give you more of a um, smoother line and thus showing a much easier, or thus making your data set much easier to see. Obviously this can change depending on how you choose to take this moving mean. You can choose a number greater than three. So for example, if you choose four or five, you'll be taking the first four or five data sets and calculating the moving mean or the moving average. And depending on your data, you might be taking a much larger number like 80 or 90. Uh, this again is taken from the solution from SSN IT. So I'll be introducing um, well, our first Jupyter notebook. Um, here we go. So um, and again, this uh, Jupyter Notebook can be the um, AI 5G, 5G and machine learning challenge. If I could maybe ask Thomas to uh, add the link to the chat. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to take everyone through this data pre-processing uh, Jupyter Notebook. 
So here first we import our basic libraries, which is NumPy, Pandas, SKLine, and Matplotlib. And then here we're deciding on the path. So this, all this data should be in the GitHub as well, but basically we're taking, we're deciding or we're showing where the, the, the data is. So our data right now is currently in a folder called data. And then we use pandas to read the CSV files. So our important one here actually is the training and testing data set. So we're reading the CSV files for the training data set and the testing data set. And using this code here, dot head, we're just checking the first five lines of the data set. So what we first decided to do here is we decided to drop the numbers column because it's just a numbering. It's probably not important. And then we decided to take out this timestamp. So we changed this from Unix timestamp to a normal date time format because it's just generally easier to see. Uh, this might not be necessary in the end, but we have just decided to change it here so it looks easier and it's easier to read overall. So in this problem statement, what we wanted to do was we wanted to take the RSSI values to estimate the latitude and the longitude. And so here, what we've done first is we've plotted out the RSSI values on this graph here. And as you can see, it's quite a jerky movement. So our goal here is to smoothen this out. So there are a number of ways you can do this. You can use first a pandas function right here, you, just by calling dot rolling dot mean. Uh, you can just smoothen it out automatically. The number here is basically our window size. So earlier that number was three, and right now we're taking 80, obviously because we have a lot more observations. And then here we're taking out our null values and adding that on as a new feature here. As you can see here, this is the moving average of this column RSSI. Uh, we don't like these null values, so we're dropping that here again and creating a new data frame. And then here we're just plotting out how um, the smoothing worked out. So the blue is our original data and the orange is our smoothened data. So as you can hear, it doesn't have a huge effect now. It's mostly following the original data, but it does smooth things out a little bit. Obviously, if you take a larger number for the window size right here, you can see more of a smoothened effect uh, that changes depending on how you want to treat your data. Um, instead of using a pre-existing function, you can also define it yourself. So I'm just going to take us through how you would define it yourself. So first you create an empty list, start I off as zero, and then decide on your window size. Here we're putting it as 90. And then we put this through a loop where we decide on a window size. So this one is from i to i plus window size. So if we start from zero, this takes all numbers from zero to 90. So this takes all the numbers of the artist i column here from zero to 90, adds all the numbers together and divides it to get the average. And then we add it to our existing list here. And then in this section, what we're doing is we're replacing the null values. So as we saw at the very beginning, when you do the moving average, the first uh, values here uh, get replaced by null. So because we don't want that, we're basically replacing it here with the first numbers of the moving average list here. And then we return our moving average. And then what we're doing here is we're basically adding, an, yes, and again, a new column here for our new uh, moving average data here. Here, we're just checking the length of this list here to make sure that it matches our original data set length. So if we check here, this is at 5,121, which is and perfectly matches the number of rows on our original data set. And then here, we're just checking our data again. It's been successfully added. And we're just plotting out our second smoothened data here. So again, you can just simply use the function that comes with pandas here, or you can define your own uh, moving average function here.
Okay, so that is smoothing. Obviously, this was the moving uh, mean technique, but we can also use a bin smoothing technique. So a bin smoothing is the idea that fx can be considered a constant if fx only changes slightly. So if I just explain this for an example, if we have a data such as this, where it's numbers from 8, 9 to 30, 34, we can separate these in equal frequencies into a number of bins. So we take four pieces of data each to create and separate into different bins. And we can calculate the average here and replace all these numbers with 12. Here is 23 and here is 30. Uh, this is also a technique that is used as well. Next, we have data transformation. So data transformation is the idea of changing our data sets and our data values. So oftentimes we can get data sets that have values of different scales. So for example, if we take a look at our data set here, the number of people is in the, uh, the thousands and 10,000s, but the price is in the tens and hundreds. So what uh, data transformation can do is it can change these values so that they fit into a certain scale. There are again, many ways to do this, but the two that I'm introducing today is the min-max scalar and the standard scalar. The min-max scalar basically scales down the data so that it has a set minimum and a set maximum. Oftentimes, minimum is zero and the maximum is one. Or we can standardize it, which makes the mean as zero and the variance as one. This is very simple to do. We just need to import the standard scalar from the sklearn.processing library, create our scalar, and then fit and transform our data. And it will automatically do so. There are other ways of data transformation as well. You can also do lab encoders and one-hot encoding. So what this does is it deals with ordinal values and changes them into numerical values. So if we take a look at our data set again here on the bottom, the profit column is separated into categories of low, medium, and high. So this is very difficult to input into a machine learning model. So what we can do is we can change these and set them into numbers so that low is one, medium is two, and high is three. So that now our numbers are one, two, three, and thus easier for our machine learning models to read. Instead of categorizing as one, two, and three, we can also do one hot encoding, which changes these values into zero or one. Um, for example, we can put profit as one and no profit as zero. And so instead of having these categories of one, two, three, you can just change them into one and zero. Uh, we will be taking a look at this example in an actual code later. And then last but not least is dimensionality reduction. So oftentimes with real world data sets, there are often too many features. And so it's necessary to reduce the number of features so that it doesn't affect the model later on. So this can help in several ways. As mentioned already, it can help reduce the number of computational resources prevent overfitting and so on and so forth. So while there are many ways to do dimensional reduction, we're going to be focusing on a few techniques, namely feature selection. So feature selection is the process of reducing the number of features according to how relevant they are to the output. Um, the simplest way is to use the correlation coefficient, which comes with the regression models. The correlation coefficient basically calculates how much certain X data or X features implement or affect the, the Y outcomes. This is simply done by importing the regression model, fitting our data, and then just calculating using the function that already comes with the regression package. So we'll take a look at our code again. This again can be found in the GitHub. So this is taken from a problem statement published by KDDI in 2020. So again, we're importing just our usual libraries and setting the path to the data, which again is in the data folder. We're reading our CSV files using pandas. And then we're just showing the top five values of the data set. As we can see here, we've got an unnamed zero column here, which is just 
numbering again. So what we're going to do first is we're just going to drop them so that our data doesn't have this redundant column. So as we can see here from this number, as well as if you print out the code dot shape, you can see the data set and the data set size. As you can see, we have 997 columns this way. So there's a lot of features in this data set. So what we want to do is we maybe want to choose the top 20 or 30 features that really affect our outcome and maybe just work with those. So right here, what we would do is we would import the linear regression um, model. Well, today we're going to be using linear regression, but you can also use logistic regression and other models as well. And we're also going to import matplotlib to just plot out our features later on. This is redundant, this is unnecessary, but right here, we basically import or create a model based on linear regression and then fit our X train and Y train values. Our Y train values, although not important currently, is actually this V type code here. And then the X values or the X features or all the rest of V columns. And then all we have to do is we have to print out the model intercept and the model coefficient. So what we want to hit see really here is the model coefficient. So we'll basically go through this loop here to print out the uh, coefficient. So these are basically just showing how much each feature, so feature zero, one, two, three, affects or influences um, the y outcomes. So as you can he see here, we just get a list of all 997 uh, features. 995. So here are just two graphs that plot out uh, the the feature the scores here, and this graph basically just takes the twenty largest feature important the twenty la uh, twenty features that have the largest importance values. And what we can do from here is we can decide maybe to take twenty or thirty of the is to then actually use and train our model. So here, as we can see, we have not used um, a standard scalar or any kind of scalar to scale our data. So we're just going to try and scale our data using the standard scalar. So here again, we just import our standard scalar and then fit transform our test. Just make sure that with the training data set, you fit transform, but with the testing data set, you only transform. And then we fit our data. And then again, we use the exact same code to print out the feature importance. And these are our results. As you can see here, however, compared to the numbers that we saw here, we can see a huge difference here. That's giving us numbers way too large for us to deal with. And so our conclusion here is that maybe this standard scalar was not correct for our data set. Maybe our data set is a little bit too sensitive or it's just not the correct scalar to use. So what we can do is we can either not use a scalar or we can use other scalars um, to scale our data. So this is just the simplest way you can do feature selection. So we're just going to take a look at some advanced techniques that some of the other problem statement solutions have used before. So one method of feature selection, so there are many libraries, so we just used linear regression. Uh, but there is also a library you can use called XGBoost, uh, which is a scalable distributed gradient boosted decision tree machine learning library. It was used in um, a, a solution from UT Nicol AI team from one of our 2020 problem statements. So this one's using the same data set that I just showed you here. So it has 997 columns. So it's quite large. So what they did was they did XGBoost to calculate the top uh, 20, I believe, features, and then just use a certain percent of the top features. 
Uh, you can also use other ways instead of uh, feature selection. So one way that was used in one of our previous solutions was pooling. So pooling layers are often found in, oops, sorry, pooling layers are often found in convolutional neural networks. So a convolutional neural network, also known as CNN or convent, is a class of neural networks that specializes in processing data, that has a grid-like topology, such as an image. So this pooling area already exists in one of the hidden layers here. What it does is it basically reduces the dimension of the data. So oftentimes we use a method called max pooling. So if you have data like this and you put it through a max pooling layer with two by two filter, it ends up just taking the maximum of each section here, which greatly reduces the uh, dimension of our data. You can also also use uh, different kinds of pooling techniques as well, but oftentimes we use max pooling, which takes the maximum pieces of data. Uh, we can also use PCA, so principal component analysis. Uh, principal com um, component analysis is a technique that is often used in data uh, reduction. Um, it's a technique that takes high di dimension data into lower dimension data while retaining as much data information as possible. So if we take a look at a graph here what data what pca does is it takes this 3d data and then compresses it into 2d data so here is just a quick run through of how we would actually calculate um, pca so pca uses the idea of variance the more the variance the more information the feature involves so our first result or our first step is to standardize the data so not to create disparity and then we calculate the covariance matrix. The values in the covariance matrix shows the covariance of each pair of variables, so each set of features. And then we calculate the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. The eigenvectors of the covariance matrix point in the direction of the largest variance. So the eigenvector with the largest eigenvector gives us the first principal component and then the second um, principal component is taken from the second eigenvector with the second largest eigenvalue. Basically, what this does in simpler terms is that when we have a scattered data here, like so, usually our x-axis and y-axis is here and here. But what PCA does is it basically takes a new set of axes here to make it easier to read our data. And so this reduces it so that we are only looking at our two most um, relevant features. Like so. Okay, so that is it for a brief run through of um, different data pre-processing techniques. We're just going to take a quick Q&A session if anyone has any questions. There is also a survey at the moment, so if you could just answer those as well. I will take maybe two or three minutes so that everyone can answer the survey. Okay, thanks a lot, Mia, for this nice uh, introduction to data preprocessing. So we are just now in the Q&A, but after the Q&A, we, we have the Jupyter Notebook practice. So for some people who are interested to do some practice, uh, we, we can do it together uh, after the Q&A. So uh, yeah, let's open for questions. Okay, so there's a first question uh, from uh, Hannah about uh, model compression on the model itself. <clears throat> uh, in terms of the, uh, do you have an answer, Mia, or I can I can take it? No, please, please take it. Okay. So 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 far, what we have introduced, uh, we we just introduced the, the 
first part uh, of the modeling itself. <clears throat> so Mia, if you, if you can maybe open open the slides to uh, slide, I think it should be number slide number three, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So if 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 we can say if you can look at this slide, right? We we have the we collect the data, we pre-process, we build the model, and evaluation. Of course, here we have skipped uh, one or two techniques in model building, because uh, for model building you you have you have the training, uh, optimization or uh, hyperparameter tuning, as well as uh, you can now talk about uh, model compression, depending on where you want to, uh, I would say, deploy your model. So if you are talking about model compression, this is more or less like after you do the model training. But uh, for this session, we are just interested in the pre-processing part. So uh, model compression or pruning or quantization happens after you have built your model, you have op optimized it, and now you are thinking about where you, you deploy for inference. I guess this answers the question, but if not, you can always, yeah. Uh, for the Jupyter Notebook practice, I shared in the chat, I can share again, uh, where you, you, you can find uh, the Jupyter Notebook. So we have the challenge uh, GitHub page, and in the challenge GitHub, you can find all the repositories from previous years. Uh, you, you, can, you can see what, what Mia has been pointing out in the, in the slides. But also, we are going to upload the slides on this uh, uh, GitHub, so you you can get uh, all the information on, on this GitHub page repository. Of course, you you can open your microphone as well and, and speak. That's that's okay. You, you can speak. Thomas, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Vishnu. Please go ahead. Ah, uh, I guess Alil's question is whether the recording of this session will include the next part. Uh, I guess there is a yes, right? The next part mean the next session or the previous session? No, the session, I mean, the part of this session, which is going to talk about the Jupyter Notebook practice. Ah, yes, 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 yes. I guess if there are no questions, we'll move on to the Jupyter Notebook practice session. So this session is just going to be uh, for those who are interested. What we're going to do is if you would like, you can access the Jupyter Notebooks and download them from the GitHub. And we will spend or we will open this Zoom room until maybe 2.45, just so that you can play around with the Jupyter Notebook. And if you have any questions, you can come back here to type them in the chat or ask questions just by opening up your mic. So yes, we will leave the room open until 2.50 or 2.45, Thomas. Yes, I think I think you can we, we can maybe go to the Jupyter notebook and I I think but uh, should we create uh, maybe a new instance we can share and do it collaboratively? I don't, I don't know what would be the best. Um, I think if no one is having any issues downloading it directly from the GitHub and running it directly on the computer, we will be fine. If anyone needs for us to open up a, a new instance, we can do that as well. Yeah, I think you can just go as as you planned. That's okay. Okay, and if if anyone has any questions, uh, we will take them any time from now to the end of the Zoom session.
So as as Mia said, uh, this is the the GitHub repo that I've shared, and you can download or you can get uh, the data is in this folder uh, for the two uh, problems uh, statements we have shared. And if if you like to to get the Python uh, notebook for the smoothing, the first one will be here you have the notebook uh, which has been shared. You can try it on your uh, local machine. You just need to have these libraries uh, installed. Of course, the easiest is just do pip install on your Python IDE. You can use any of your favorite IDEs. And, and of course, uh, for some people, you can use also Colab, uh, Google Colab is also a good place to, to start from. So once you have these uh, libraries installed, then you, you can just go through all the steps. These are really basic steps that I would say very easy that you, you, can, you cannot get them wrong, I think. So that's the first one. Uh, for the second one also, it's, it's almost the same. We, we use the basic steps, but of course, if you go through the other, if you go back to the GitHub repo, we have 79 repositories. So if, if you can go, let's say for last year on radio link failure prediction, you go, you find that uh, the colleagues have shared, let's say the model, they have shared uh, the PDF, and you have, uh, sorry, this is also the PDF, the report. But in, in other cases, you can have also the Python uh, notebook, which has been shared and you can go through it and see what other teams uh, proposed in their solution. So really we have several uh, solutions, several techniques, several results. And of course, in, in some cases, uh, some of these uh, solutions have been, uh, I would say they have been published in the ITU journal or other journals or conference. So for example, this is the solution that uh, was used uh, that me I referred to. So if you can check, you have all the Python, for example, feature importance, you have the, the notebook that describes how they, do the implementation for the XG boost feature importance or feature ranking. So yeah, if you have any questions, please, um, we are here to answer or if, if you cannot access the notebooks that we have shared, please do let us know. Any questions or comments? Avishnu, do you have any comments? No, no I, I believe uh, one thing we can do is to use this uh, collab directly. I have put the feature selection uh, uh, feature selection notebook. Similarly, you can open it in uh, open the other notebook that uh, Thomas and me I explained in the in the collab as well uh maybe thomas if you uh if you can just i don't know whether colleagues are familiar with it if you go to colab and uh, show how to click on github and open it if you open it i can or maybe i can show myself just a second yeah yeah i can so if you what you do is that, uh, I mean, most of you might be already familiar with it, but uh, just in case you are not familiar, this is what you do. This is what I just now did, you know. <laughs> so I, I took, uh, I went here to work collab and uh, I look at, uh, I look at opening a new, new file and it gives me this. I click on GitHub. I mean, you can, you can look at others if you like, but I look at GitHub and uh, if i type the uh, if i type the 
from from um, from the uh, link that uh, GitHub link. From the GitHub link, you can get uh, uh, the mentoring sessions. And here is the URL for the um, for the notebook, right? So this is the GitHub that uh, Thomas showed it in the end, it is available in the chat window. So you take that and put it here. This is the same same GitHub uh, notebook link and you can click, uh, um, uh, you can search for it and it will come up like what I showed you. So that's what you do to open it in, uh, in uh, GitHub and you should be able to see it. Thank you. If you don't have a GitHub account, of course you have to create one, uh, but that's quite easy as well. Yes. So yeah, you, you, there's uh, many many ways to to get started. I, I believe you can use your computer, uh, download uh, Python and get started also you can use google collab the link has been shared you can copy it or download it or share it to your google drive and get started that's another easy way as well uh, for people working in the challenge and if you have uh, there are some problem statements with really big data sets and maybe you don't have access to very good compute uh, very good gpus you can request the GPUs from us and we can lend it to you for free. But of course they are for a limited amount of time. So you cannot use it as much as you can, but, but for a limited number of time, because these are resources that we'd like to share to as many people as possible. So please, if you, if you are working on some problem statement and you would like to get access to the GPUs, uh, please mm, check with us. And I believe we are almost clo uh, close to uh, to the closing time. So we, we can finish the session around here. I don't know, Mia, you have something to say? Um, yes, thank you everyone for joining. Um, again, if you have any questions, please ask them in the next few minutes because we will be closing the session. Um, we do have some other mentoring sessions prepared for in the new future. Uh, we will have one or two until the end of September. So please, uh, if you are interested, watch out for our emails. Thank you. That's it from me. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. So see you next time in our next mentoring session. If, if you have comments or questions on what kind of sessions you need us to, to prepare, please do send us an email to the challenge uh, email address. So thank you so much and have a good day. Bye.